just got myself all set up to divide some of these auriculars um, propagating by division it's that time of year you can do that just after they've finished flowering so as you can see there they, they have finished flowering um, and then I thought I'm sure I've done a video of this so I went onto the channel I, I, had, I had a search and we did um, almost four years ago Myself and Ruby made a video about how to propagate auriculars. We had a window box planter, uh, an orange one. It was about that kind of size there. Um, and it, it had about three or four auriculars in. We made the video about dividing them. So this is what we're, we've got now. We've got that clump there. That clump there with several auriculars in, which I will be dividing shortly. And then over here... We've got a pot full of them there, and a, and a pot with about, what, three or four in there? So all, over time, it takes a couple of years, but over time, they, they spread themselves out and they, they carry on growing and they make more plants themselves. And over a few years, they'll form new plants next to the one that you've, you've popped in. So we've now got quite a healthy collection of auricula. When I got them from the supermarket when i bought one in a pot it didn't have a variety on it just said auricula but if you look here here's one flower that hasn't died yet that's what they look like and they're all the same mid to late spring they'll start flowering for you when they die off early summer which it is now right let's get working just in case you've not seen that video i will put the link in the description but another thing i'll do is i'll just quickly talk about the the compost right they don't like being sat in very waterlogged boggy wet soil so i'm going to add a lot of this gravel into our compost mix this is just homemade compost nothing special i bag it up into compost bags from where we have bought compost um and then into there, I'm going to add lots of this gravel and grit for the drainage. Give the plant the condition that it likes. Like I say, it doesn't like sitting in very wet soil. Some more compost. More grit. Pot's ready. Like I say, I have already made a video about this, so I'm, I'm not going to show you the dividing process now. Um, but I will put the link to that video in the description. And if you want to see how we divide auriculars to propagate them, then you may click on the link, should you wish. What I will show you, though, is where the clump was in the pot that I've just propagated from. Um, I've dug up the whole clump, taken a few of the auriculars out. I'm going to refresh and add to the compost. This is a little way of saying sorry and thank you at the same time to this stock plant, if you will, or group of plants that I've taken from. Um, because it can be a little bit stressful for a plant when you start digging its roots up and what have you so I'm just going to replenish its food supply make sure the roots get covered the strawberries in the food forest are doing ace Look at these. Oh yeah. And there's a few more around there. But, 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 and also, yeah, we've got some up here. But, we want the best fruits we possibly can get. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off this runner. Um, if that was allowed to carry on going, where that comes in contact with the soil, it'll form roots and it'll start a new little plant. But, that's costing energy to the mother plant and at the moment we want all the energy to go 
into producing the strawberries. So I've snipped that off. We'll let it keep making strawberries. And then when the strawberries have been and gone, then I will let the runners do their thing. I'll pop them up. I'll either pop them up or pin them down, remove some of this bark mulch so we can get in contact with the soil. Let them make their own root system. And then they'll they'll form the new their own new plants which we can plant out elsewhere. But for now, get rid. This liatris uh, variety is called violet. It's I don't know if you can see just in there. It's starting to form what will be the flower spikes. So to help it, I'm going to give it. In fact, there's quite a few all around the plant. Um, I'm going to give it a bit of a feed and I think the way I'm going to do this is we'll add some blood fish and bone and then I'll add an inch or two of compost mulch as well it has been mulched earlier on in the year but you can never really mulch enough I'm a big fan of mulching it'll feed the plant and it also helps keeps the weeds down right let's get the blood fish and bone out then so Ruby's sprinkling on some blood fish and bone this will do a few things it's got the three main uh, nutrients in it the nitrogen potash phosphorus but the, the potash in it will help the flowers when the flowers form like the nitrogen will, will just help the plant itself the leaf the leaf growth of course the phosphorus what the phosphorus will do it will it'll help the roots so all three main ingredients really are just in general helping the plant, right? So she's tickled that in to the soil. In fact, Ruby, if we turn it round, do you want to do the back side as well? Yep. Cheers, mate. Just going to add a bit there. Oops. Right, drill. And then... I think we'll, we'll water it now. What settings that on? Yeah, that's all right. Oh, watering, <laughs> it's not on. <laughs> right, okay, we can water it in a bit. Now, we're just gonna add a few handfuls of compost mulch. Just homemade compost. We'll just add it around on top of where we've just put the blood fish and bone. Another little thing that I do is um, I look for worms and a good place to look for worms is under plant, pots. under plant pots so I'll go around, I'll lift up plant pots so if I see a plant pot with worms underneath things like this um, liatris in a pot I will just put put worms into the pot it helps you want as many worms as you can and also with the compost bins they're a brilliant place for looking for worms nearly done right i'd say that's about done Ru. so do you want to pop the gnomes back carefully And these are self-watering, so you put water self -watering, in the back, yeah. and then it drips out through the bottom. Brilliant. So, these liatris, they like a sunny position, um, in moist soil, but well-drained as well. They don't want to be sitting in a, a bog, but the soil does like to be moist. Quite rich soil. And the flower in the summer. And... They do get taller than this, especially when the flower spikes start growing up. They'll, they'll get about, what, just over half a metre tall. So, we'll sort out the hose pipe and give this a, a bit of a drink now. Did you turn that hose off like I asked you? Oh, of course I did. I swear, like, if he sprays us in the face one more time with that hose, I'm going to have him. Just a quick little word about some insect pests, aphids. I've got these little black i don't know if you can make them out hang on let's find a better place right there focus there we are little black aphids that the the ants are they, they sort of like 
The ants like shepherd them, if you will, because they get honeydew from them. Is it honeydew? I think it's called honeydew. Um, so the ants will move them around, these little black aphids, and they'll feed on the the new growth, the tips, and as it's doing on this Philadelphus Bell Etoile Mock Orange. And then the ants feed off them, the, uh, <clears throat> the byproduct that they produce. But I don't want them. I'm going to get rid of them. I, I mean, this plant doesn't do the best as it is because it, I so need to repot it. It's in quite a smallish pot. We've had it a good few years. I mean, I do mulch and feed it, but, you know, the bigger, the bigger pot we can give it, the better, really. So what we're going to do is just a spray bottle of water, a smoosh of washing up liquid. Mm, a bit more. That'll do. Right. <laughs> There's some bubbles gone. I see a couple. Right. And then we're just going to spray the aphids. Because it, the greasy film that the washing up liquid in the water creates, you don't need to shake it through. The greasy film will cover those aphids' breathing holes. So if I just stand up, can you get them there? And then they'll suffocate. And it doesn't really have any harmful effect on the plant, neither doing it this way, using the washing up liquid. This is our go-to method for dealing with aphids. Get the flowers and smell them. Yeah. What would you say it smells like? I don't really know. It smells nice though. It's supposed to smell of like an orange bubble gum. Yeah. Would you agree or? Mm -hmm. Right, you can spray it now. <coughs> right now, all I can smell is washing up liquid. It, <laughs> it does smell nice actually. Right. Have you given all the bits we can see a good? There's also some on the lovage. So the beauty of using this spray method with just water and washing up liquid is, is it's very targeted. You're targeting the insects that are there, there and then at that time where you're spraying them. So as opposed to some of the pyrethroid based insecticides they, they will stay on the plant and when things like bees and other will very welcome pollinators land in it they'll pick up a dose and it'll kill them it's fairly indiscriminate using those type of pesticides but this way you're literally only targeting the insects that are there at the time i can see some hiding around there there's quite a lot there In the food forest, the, the clue is in the title, a forest of food. And within that forest, you have different layers of plants. So you've got like your ground plants, uh, the root plants that just like grow in the soil, if you will. Um, you've got small shrubs, which I'm trying to have as fruit bushes. And you've got vining plants that, that go, grow through it all. Um, and you've got like the, the taller plants which will give you a canopy. And I'm trying to create a system where it sort of looks after and feeds and support itself. So, although strictly speaking, that you wouldn't really grow a lupin as an edible. And I say strictly speaking, you can. Um, I'll put a link to a meaning of plants video about lupins that I've done where there was a, um, a fellow in Germany, I think it was, he had a looping banquet where all of the dishes served were made from parts of the looping plant. Um, but we're not going to eat this. <clears throat> what we're going to use this for is it is a legume, similar to peas and beans, and one of the properties of those type of plants is they, have, they are nitrogen fixers. So they, they will... They've got nodules on the roots in the soil and they take nitrogen out of the air and they fix them in the ground through these nodules. So I'm going to plant this near some nitrogen loving plants 
uh, the leafy plants, the, the flat leaf parsley. I've got some some chard up there. I've got some chives down here. I'm going to put this roughly here, I think. Oh no, not there, because that is the walkway. <laughs> Ruby, I found the walkway plank. <laughs> it's buried, covered. That's because we have blackbirds that come in and dig up all the the bark mulch. Right, so I'm going, I can move that actually. Let's move that. Put that there. Let's get rid of some of that bark. I'm going to plant that roughly there. There's plenty of edible nitrogen fixing plants which I could have used. I didn't have any at the time. So I've used what I had to hand. I had a few lupins that have grown from seed. To fill this space, I'm going to plant one of them into it. But the, there are many edible, which are more suited for a food forest. There are many edible nitrogen fixing plants. There it is. I'll give this a drink. Um, it is a bit on the floppy side, but it'll find its way. It'll soon sort itself out. And the variety is Pixie Delight. Same variety that we've got a couple of up at the allotment as well. These alliums were absolutely beautiful. Uh, we had about, what, four of them, I think? Four big ones? But they've been and gone now, and they're going to seed. And one thing you can do with these is use them as like um, a dried flower, a cut dried flower as an ornamental. And as luck would have it... That's my mum. She's she's come round. She's socially distancing. She's got rubber gloves on and a face mask. You look like a protester just about to go out and riot. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. So I'm going to cut one of these for my mum, and then she can take it home and. Um, spray it gold. Yeah, I think you need to dry them out, but then spray it like you say. She's going to spray it gold. I'll just snip it there. So it's nice, that isn't it? Right, um, oh, I can give you some herbs. Yeah. I can't spray those gold, though, can I? No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you, that's lovely. You're all right. That's beautiful. Yeah. You're all right, Mum. Yeah, I'm, really I'm trying to think what have we got a lot of I can get. Do you want some winter savoury herb? You could do, please. Right, yeah. girls, do you want to cut Grandma a, a good handful of winter savoury? So that's that one there. That's the one that we eat with um, Jerusalem farty chokes because apparently there's something in it that cancels out the windy effect that the farty chokes have. But it's it's just a nice sort of like savoury herb. Find juice and artichokes, a bit fibrous, a bit... You find them a bit fibrous. Yeah. yeah. Is it, is it, oh, is that for me? Oh, mm -hmm. thank right, you. So it's put it there and you, you get back. And then you, yeah. you get back rude, that's it. And then Grandma can come in and um, can you reach mum? Yeah, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll... I'll keep filming just in case you fall over, it'll be ace. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, I'll, I've left a bit behind. Oh, don't I'm don't worry about that. Unless you really want it, it's alright, it's alright. Oh, that smells beautiful. Good. Is it, is it like an organo? Um, I don't know, I would describe it. Yeah, I it's suppose very, there's very, a... It's very it's, yeah. it's very aromatic, isn't it? Yeah, it's very, very... It's similar to oregano, yeah. Yeah, so if you're making a stew or anything, it'd be good for that. Can I take anything out for I'm here? Yeah, what else have we got? <laughs> sage? Yes, do you want some sage? Yes, please, I wouldn't mind. Give you some purple set. Have you got them snippers? Sorry, Ruth. Just, just like some rhubarb, because we've got quite a bit. Mm. Yeah, do you want a couple of stalks of rhubarb, yes, Mum? I do, I love rhubarb. Right, let's get, let's get some stalks of rhubarb. So you get the purple sage, I'll start getting some rhubarb. It's really nice to see you, Mum. Nice to see you. Yeah. You just wanted to be in a YouTube video, didn't you? I did, yeah. <laughs> well, I go, I go around and catch you. <laughs> oh, that, that was the most exciting day, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, so we got... Let's get some of this. So if, can I, if I wrap that and put string 
Yeah. Right, let's get some more. Right, Rhubos, mm -hmm. please can you um, snip the leaves off these rhubarbs for me? And then we just give Grandma the stalk bits. Oh, I've got some more in my hand here, I forgot. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Right. Some, just two. But the 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 pushing the look because they're not giving us eggs for months. Are they quite old? Not really. I don't. I don't well, I don't think they are. Um, I don't think so. There's that house near me that still they still have them. So. You can still adopt them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, I'm I'm still drinking. Occasionally, I find one of your spearmint tea bags. All right. They were lovely. And Stacey likes them. Nice one. Stacey always says, have you got any Stuart's spearmint tea bags? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Right, thank you very much. Now I've, I've uh, ruined your garden. Oh, no, you haven't. You haven't. You haven't. I'll, I'll send us a picture. Now you know how to use a smartphone. <laughs> send us a picture of what you end up doing with that. That is getting in the way of the garage door. So, although strictly speaking, you shouldn't really trim bushes and hedges at this time of year because birds can still be nesting. I've had a good look in there. We haven't got any birds' nests and I'm not going to give it a huge prune or trim. I'm just literally going to take a couple of inches off so that the garage door can move more freely. So if I was trimming this hedge um, as, as a formal structure, um, like a, a proper ornamental, just for the aesthetic of it, what I would do is I would put what we call a slight batter on the hedge. Um, I, I don't mean dipping it in eggs and flour, it's, it's like an angle and when you batter, <laughs> it sounds horrendous, <laughs> when you batter a hedge, right, you sort of like, you're trimming it inwards towards the top. So there's a very slight, ever so slight slope on it where it's narrower at the top part of the hedge than it is at the bottom. This just helps with the structure of the hedge because of it's, it's about the weight distribution, you see. Um, it will help keep its shape better. And if you live in areas where you get quite a heavy snowfall, having a batter on your hedge also helps with that weight distribution and, and the hedge will just keep its structure and form a lot better. When you're trimming hedges, it's a good idea, especially if you're doing it to keep a nice neat line or shape, every now and again step back and look because when you're up close, excuse the pun, but sometimes you literally cannot see the wood for the trees. So if you step back, you get to see the shape and form while you're doing it before you start going off and start making cuts where you don't want them to be cuts. Right, let's test it. Let's see if that garage door can move a little bit easier now. Perfect. What starts with K and ends with compost material? Hmm. I'll be honest with you, when I was moving my hands around the back of those two white stones, I was terrified that I was going to nudge a frog that was hiding behind them in the shade, in the damp. I don't like frogs. I like looking at them, but from a distance. You can't trust them. You don't know where they're going to jump at. Like Julie Andrews once sang, Manchester City winning, Nigella Lawson, my family, Italian food and compost material. These are some of my favourite things. Motion shot. If I speed this up, will you get seasickness? Now there's that awkward moment that all YouTube gardeners I'm sure can relate to Trying to do things one-handed while you hold the camera. When you're using shears to cut things like conifers, um, they can have like a, a, quite a sticky, sappy resin in them. And you don't really want it staying on your blades. So when you've used them for cutting something like that, I'm just going to give them a bit of a wash now. I probably need to do this more often with my tools. I don't give them the care that they deserve to get considering how much I ask of all my garden tools. They, they get used a lot. So some of you might have noticed that the blades, the metal parts are looking quite brown. It's called rust. I thought I'd get that in there before, before some smarty pants puts it in a comment. And I know that water causes rust. Keep watching. Now these underpants are magic underpants. Right, when I get a pair of undies that have an hole in them, what I use them for is a cleaning rag. 
So my magical underpants, they had a lovely hyacinth print on them, did you notice? Anyhow, my magical underpants are gonna clean these shears. Just to get all that resiny sap off, to stop them gumming up, stop the blades getting gummy and sticky. And to help with this, I put a drop of washing up liquid into the water. If I had some wire wool or a wire brush, I would now give them a really good scrubbing and get some of that rust off, but I don't. So I'm going to dry them instead, get the, any excess water off. And the next thing I'm going to do is I've got uh, one of those knife sharpeners that professional chefs use really, really, really quickly. And it looks like they're going to cut their arms off. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Now on these blades, there's two sharp edges and both sharp edges touch each other, if that makes sense. So, I'm only going to sharpen the sharp edges <laughs> on each blade. If you've got something like this that you can use to sharpen your blades with on, on your shears or secateurs, whichever garden tool you're doing it with, don't get too worried about the angle. You'll, if you look closely at the blade, you'll see there's an angle on the blade. Just put your knife sharpener along that angle and run it down the length of the blade. Now spraying my shears with a well-known product. Does a few things, this particular product. Um, it's a degreaser, it's a lubricant, and it also re repels moisture, so it'll help protect that metal, prevent further rust. These chives are past the best. The, the flowers are starting to wane now. And you can see a lot of the growth, it's, it's flopping over, it's got far too long, very leggy, and some of it's starting to go yellow at the tips and, and die. So what we're going to do is, they call it the Chelsea Chop, um, sort of like late May, early June. Plants like chives, you can cut back down to just a, a couple of inches above the ground, and they'll regrow, no problem whatsoever. And we might even get a second flush of flowers towards end of August into September so I'm just going to cut these back now there's loads of like herbaceous perennials that you can do the Chelsea chop on plants like asters, achilleas, echinaceas, penstemons, phlox, these chives um, what, what, one of the things it'll do is those stems that you cut back it's going to delay their growth by about roughly four weeks so we can use this cleverly. If you cut half of your plant back, what will happen is, is the rest of the plant that's, that's left uncut, that will continue to flower. And as those flowers start to fade and, and die, the, the part of the plant that you've, you've done the Chelsea chop to, that will then be up there ready with a brand new flower. So by, by taking away, you're actually getting more because you're going to prolong the flowering season. I haven't done a half and half on these chives. I've just done the whole lot. I know chives can take it. They're quite a, a robust plant. It does look brutal, I know, but you, you've got to have a bit of faith. They do come back, promise. <laughs> and then, oh, I had a bee. Look, there's a bee on the ones I've just cut. There you go. Um, yeah, I can... I could go through these and salvage the ones that are usable, get them used in cooking, I could preserve them. You can use the flower heads, they make a nice uh, vinegar, chive infused vinegar. But I can't be bothered, so I'm going to treat the chickens and give the chickens some. So, right, are you ready ladies? We're lucky we had any chives left to do the Chelsea chop with. Ruby is almost constantly feeding those chickens chives it's it's a miracle there's any left right, and they've also got some chickweed and what have you in there as well so they can pick through them all now still got a few sea potatoes left over um that's an aaron pilot relatively quick growing it's a first early so it's not a main crop it doesn't need a a really long period of time in the ground Gonna put it in this big empty pot we've got, but it's not got any holes drilled in it, so we need to fix that. We don't want to plant it into a bog, we want some drainage in there. 
If you're doing any drilling like this on an upturned pot to put some drainage holes in, can you see how we've both got a foot on the pot? It'll just stop it spinning round, which is dangerous. Safety first, thumb never. I know I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again because I, I really strongly believe in it. Look how easy it is for us to grow some food. We just need a container, some soil or compost, and then the actual whatever it is you're planting in this case it's it's a seed potato but please 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 don't be put off by trying to grow your own food you don't need a garden that most people imagine when they think of as a garden i.e lots of grass and soil look i'm doing this in a plant pot on tarmac and we're gonna get if we're lucky about 10 maybe a few more decent sized potatoes out of this one pot give it a try I think it was last year I made a video and, and this fuchsia um, it's called something like Little Pink Dancer this fuchsia isn't it and I was complaining about how it just like you can't see the flowers um, it just flops down and, and over and someone I think it was Babette from Babette's in the Garden channel she very kindly suggested that it might be like a trailing fuchsia um, why I'd not thought of that, I don't know, <laughs> but she was absolutely right. So what we've done is we've put it in quite a tall pot um, and it's working a treat so far. The flowers haven't actually opened yet, but there are quite a few flower buds on it. Some big ones that will be open soon and some smaller ones, but it's now got the height to, to drape down and, and hang over as the, the weight of the flowers because it, it does sort of like get a lot of flowers on it this one so that's worked to treat that so I'm sure it was you Babette so thank you very much for suggesting that we will now be able to enjoy our fuchsia a lot better that we can actually see the flowers frog alert frog alert it's going away Can you see it all right, girls? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there it is in the pond, just sitting on the bottom of the wooden plank escape chute that we've got coming in and out of the pond. Can you see it? It's the best one in the pond that we've seen, I think. Well, no, I'm sure I saw some last year. But f certainly first one this year, I've not, I don't think I've seen any this year. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh. Where's it gone? I think it's underneath the log, uh, the plank. Going to get some more edibles and edible flowers, herbs, that kind of thing out into the food forest. So we've got a couple of different sowings of calendula but they're both the same uh, variety of calendula whose name escapes me right now sorry um indian some, no it wasn't indian was it i can't remember we've got some curly scarlet kale um more calendula florence fennel and three purple sprouting broccolis all gonna get put out into the food forest which I'm not being big-headed, but I think it's looking fantastic. It's like a, a sea of green. And you have to work hard to find stuff in it because but none of you can see the Verbena bonariensis is, 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 that I've got in it, can you? But I can. But that's because I know where they are. So I've dotted the odd, the odd ornamental. So there's one. How beautiful is that? They're not a big... Um, dramatic in your face plant but that's that's why i like them you've got to work for them if you want to enjoy them you've got to go and find them and, and look for them and appreciate how delicate they are there's three there that haven't opened yet well opened fully you can see a bit of color forming on the flower buds one two three there are a couple more elsewhere as well like i say it's finding them I planted that much stuff out into here, you forget where you've put everything. 
Uh, there's a couple coming up through the, the the side of the quince. Yeah. Right, let's get planting. I'm getting sidetracked again. Enjoying how beautiful these uh, plants are. Right, yeah, let's get planting. I need to work out where, where are things best going. So, towards the back of the food forest, in, back in terms of where the sun shines. The sun, the sun pretty much all day shines against that wall. Apart from a couple of hours in the morning and a couple of hours in the evening when the sun goes over that way towards Morecambe Bay. But for the majority of the day, the sun's going that way. So I think I will put the broccolis here because they're a reasonably tall plant. And then some of the smaller plants I'll put coming back towards me, if that makes sense. Well, if it doesn't make sense now, it will do by the time we've done it all. Just before we plant out, we're going to move the mulch away to get to the soil underneath. We're using bark that we bought last year when they made the food forest in, in 2019. Eventually, the kind of end goal I want to arrive at is that there'll be certain plants in that food forest. Do you remember earlier I was on about I wanted to be kind of like self-supporting, if you will, create like a an ecosystem, it's its own cycle of life. Well, eventually, I want to have more plants in that I can use as a mulch so that we're not having to rely on shop-bought mulch material. So things like more comfy. Um, we've got two different types of hazel for so that they can cross-pollinate each other. But I've read somewhere it takes about seven years of growth before you can start coppicing hazel. So, But when we do, when we get to that, position with the hazel as the food forest gets more mature and as I, I've introduced more plants into it we'll be able to for example put the hazel rods through a wood chipper and that'll give us woody material that we can use as a mulch but for now we're just having to rely on what we've spent money on but I don't want that to be the permanent state uh, two reasons one it costs money and I'm not made of money and the second reason is it kind of goes against what I'm trying to show people. I'm trying to show people that you, you know, you can garden in a, a sustainable way and you get a lot out of it without having to spend big bucks on it. So if I think if I was to just go to a shop and, and instantly buy more hazel bushes, I mean, they're not cheap, you know, <laughs> hazel bushes. It kind of goes against what I'm trying to do with this food forest. I'd much rather wait another year or two until the hazels get a little bit bigger, take some cuttings material off them and grow my own from cuttings. Uh, you know, just off the one plant that I originally spent the money on. Well, two plants that I originally spent the money on for those hazels. Another part of the end goal where I want the food forest to be is that almost all of the planting is perennial. Um, but again, I'm not made of money. I can't just go out and instantly buy a load of fruit bushes, for example. So it's going to take time. In that meantime, before we've got the garden full of almost entirely perennials, I'm still going to be filling up gaps and little open spaces with annuals, things that I've grown from seed, which is a very, very cheap way of getting your own plants actually doing it from seed it's ridiculously cheap if you work it out the price per plant if you get a couple of hundred seeds in a packet and you've spent a pound on a packet of seeds it's less than one pence a plant and you get something to eat from it as well and this is where it gets really good and will save you an awful lot of money if you learn about that plant and, and find out how you can save the seeds from that plant, whatever it is you're growing. Um, I mean, for example, right now we're planting out a Florence fennel, which I know is a pretty easy plant to take the seeds off. When it starts to go to flower and it throws up a flower spike, um, well, before that stage, you would probably have harvested most of your Florence fennel. But if you leave one or two back, right, let them flower, let those flowers die off, the flowers will turn into seeds and which then can then be collected, dried and stored and planted out next year. So you'll buy one pack of seeds and like I say, if you, if you 
Take the time to find out how to save those seeds off the plants that grow from the seeds you've bought. You've pretty much got a lifetime supply of free seeds there, haven't you? So you know they say some sports managers have a philosophy. Well, this is my garden philosophy. It shouldn't be expensive. This is a parsley from last year. We planted it last year along the edge because it's a small, low-growing plant. Um, yeah, so in its gap where it was, Olivia is planting one of the Florence fennels. I mean, the, the, it will get a bit of height on the the stalks and the, the fennelly fronds, um, but not enough, I wouldn't have thought, to shade out all the, the, the relatively low-growing plants that are behind it. So have we, have we got enough bark mulch to put around that, do you think? Or mm. just try and we'll lift, lift all the stems up, that's it. Sort of like cut them gently in your hand and lift them up out the way, then you can move the bark around it. Great job. Great job. We've got four garlics in here that were overwintered and I'm going to empty them and make the space in this pot um, for some calendulas. We we don't want to plant like all of the calendulas out in the food forest, although we, we could, but we're, we're going to have some in a pot as well. Um, yeah, we, we, we mainly grow the calendulas, not just because they look nice, it's, it's for the... We make like a skin oil, a calendula oil, using grape seed oil as the carrier. And we we dehydrate them, then we steep them in the oil. And it, it, it's just really, really good stuff. It's, it's brilliant for dry skin, but you can use it for lots of other things as well. So let's get these out and let's get some calendulas planted up. In the last allotment video that we made, we did a huge harvest of garlics. I think we got something like 44 garlic bulbs that were overwintered. These have been overwintered too. Um, we've still got more garlics to come from the allotment. We've uh, just going off memory because I'm not sitting at my allotment right now as I tell you this. I think we've got at least one raised bed with more garlics in. So there's probably there'll be multiples of three the way we plant them so I can't remember how many rows we did but there'll either be 12, 15 or 18 minimum more garlics still to come I mean we'll use the huge majority of it we, a few we'll, we'll give away but we'll use the vast majority of it we've got one decent sized one and tiddlers, the rest are tiddlers but they'll all get eaten, they'll all get used I'm going to very quickly take off the, the few weeds that are growing in this pot and then I'll refresh and rejuvenate the soil that's in there by adding some good big chunky handfuls of our homemade compost. You can't really expect anything to grow in that soil considering it's had garlic sitting in it since what about middle of September last year so I'm, I'm topping up the compost adding some new food for the calendulas that we're going to plant out in there. Now if you're going by the book, the planting distance, each plant calendula should be about eight to 10 inches apart. I pretty much halving the distance to really pack out this little planter that I'm putting them into. Um, I'm not just blatantly disregarding the rules, setting myself up for failure. I know that my compost will grow good plants. Also, I can back that up with the comfy liquid feed that we've currently got brewing, um, which should be ready in another week or two. Once I, I start giving that comfy feed to feed the plants, coupled with the good few inches of compost that I've just added to the pot, I know those plants in there will be fine. I don't recommend <laughs> anyone watching this to go against perceived gardening wisdom however until you start to learn a bit yourself you, you'll learn what works for you just because the book says 8 to 10 inches in your conditions with your soil your compost your feeding regime you might do 6.34 inches and the plants will be still exactly the same it, it, you know it's, it's all different for each of us I know what works best for me can you bring the camera over and me. Leave it for me. 
Now if there's a light tilt it. I just want to show you these. Look at the Delo Sperma Jewel of Desert Grenade. And they're like a little succulent and they open up when the sun shines on them. And then when the sun goes in, they close up again. And I love them. They're looking a bit scraggly. There's probably, uh, they probably need sorting out, but for now, I'm just enjoying for what they are. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> right, we've, we've done now in the garden. Spinny chair, whoa! <laughs> we got a lot done, didn't we? Yeah. So in the food forest, we've planted out um, some edibles. We mm -hmm. put purple sprouting broccoli. Was it three or four? We've done some red curly kale. Mm -hmm. We've done some edible flowers, um, like the borage. And suppose you could eat the calendula petals as well. Some people do mix them into salads, but we've also planted out calendulas. But we're not going to grow them to eat them. We're going to make some calendula skin oil. Because if you look carefully, I do get dry skin down the sides of my nose. What are you doing? Do you get dry skin? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else have we done? Um, try to find the other nasturtium plant. Yeah, for the life of us, I can't, I can't find that. I'm sure last weekend we planted out two nasturtiums and I can only find one in the food forest. I can't for the life of me think where we put the other one. I might have to watch through one of the videos we made last weekend and, and see if I talked about it. Um, I, I, we've done loads. We've, I've planted up another potato. So a frog in the pond. So a frog in the pond, which hopefully you've you've seen in the video, unless you've like skipped it all and just come <laughs> straight to the end. Uh, Olivia's been helping us doing loads as well. Yeah, she's currently sitting over there, looking ace. I'll make a gardener with her yet. In fact, she's been doing really, really well this weekend with her gardening stuff. Aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's catching you up, isn't she? I know, she? she's threatening my dusty head garden a lot. <laughs> right, so, ah, yes, I wanted to say, I've noticed um, we're getting a load of new subscribers recently. And just thank you very much and welcome. Welcome to the channel. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few different things we do. We do, we've got the allotment, so I film up there. We've got the backyard with ornamentals and we've also in the backyard got most of it is a food forest area uh, which is an ongoing work in progress we, we built it last year but it's it's still ongoing it's not finished is it no there's still more things to to be planted out that fit into a food forest um we make meaning of plants videos do you want to describe a meaning of plants um, for you? So, a meaning of plants, say if I pick a, I don't know, a rose, because I'm looking at one from a window. Say if I picked a rose, um, Dad will describe the rose and, like, its um, name in Latin name. And he'll um, say, like, a poem or a script or something about it that's, like, a story type bit. And then he'll... Um, what would you say the other bit? Folklore. It's, yeah. it's folk. So it's the, it's what those plants mean to to different people. It's not. And sometimes he'll say the nickname of it. So. Yeah, yeah, common names. And mm -hmm. if I can find out why those common names came about, for example, goosegrass in Scotland, they call Sticky Willy. I can't wait to find out why they call that one Sticky Willy. So it's about the folklore of plants, what they mean to different people in different parts of the world. Um, we make uh, food preservation videos, mm -hmm. looking at the food that we grow. We garden do. News is now on there. Oh yes, we've got a series called the Garden News. So I've got loads of ideas written down for let for more videos. Choose. Oh yes, we have a Let the Chickens Choose challenge where you can send in suggestions, and our chickens will will make the choice. Um, yeah, look out for those. One the, of my favourites. Yeah, they're quite good, aren't they? Right, so yeah, right, well, as always, thank you all of you so much for watching. Mm -hmm. It's goodbye from me, Stu. And goodbye from me, Ruby. Deputy Head Gardener. Mm -hmm. right, I just want to blow a raspberry on your cheek. <laughs> <laughs> Saw that cheek then, and I'm like, raspberry. <laughs> right, see you guys. Bye. <laughs>